panel on solving for engagement, going right to the heart of the theme of the event. And but before we start, Christy uh, has a question for all of you. We're going to pose a poll question. Christy, if you if you haven't met Christy before, she's the um, she's a 22 year veteran of the PGA Tour. She works on the tour's customer database and focuses on the topic of uh, uh, that that's at hand for the show engagement. Christy, are you there? I know that she's out there somewhere. While we're waiting for Christy to come on, I will I will ask the question so you guys can get started on answering. Christy's question was, how do your 2021 to date engagement rates compare to your March to December 2020 engagement rates? In other words, has your first quarter this year compared to your last quarter? Has it increased? Has it held steady? Has it decreased? And we'll give you a few minutes to do that, or a few seconds to do that. And while we're doing that, I hope we can get Christy in here. I am here. Sorry about that. There you are. There you are. Took, Hi, Christy. Took a minute for that invite to come through. That's OK. So while people are still answering that, why is this question important to you? Um, I'm just curious because I think you know we at the tour saw an, an engagement increase during March through December, obviously with a lot of work from home um, time on our hands kind of thing. And now we're kind of moving towards more going back to the office, um, getting into, I hate to say it, but the new normal as they call it. Um, so has that done anything to your engagement rate? How has that affected your engagement rate? If at all, maybe, maybe not, but I'm just kind of curious about that. Well, let's, let's end the poll. Cause I think we've given people time to answer it. And Held steady, I like. Looks to me like it looks like most most people, or the, at least the pluralities, have said that it's held steady or in, or increased. Very few have seen it decrease. Yeah, I like that. That's good to know. So let's get into let me let's bring in the rest of the panel and get into the topic at hand, which is what are some tips and ideas for increasing engagement as that becomes more challenging and a much more cluttered space over the next year. So take it away, Christy. Great. All right, so on the panel today, we have Caroline Bucciero. I hope I'm not butchering your name there, um, from Chromadex, and Chester Bullock from Rent Path, a email insider summit regular, and then Sierra Howe from Fandango. So welcome everyone. If you'd like to take a moment to take yourself off mute, introduce yourself, and we have our icebreaker question, which I kind of prepped them on yesterday. We have the Olympics coming up. So if you were to participate in the Olympics, what sport would you be meddling in? Hi, can everybody hear me? We, we can hear you, Sierra. Awesome. Um, so my summer Olympic sport uh, would definitely be pole vaulting because you know, you're running, you're running, you're running, and then you're giving it all you're, you got and you leap over the hurdle um, and you don't always make it over, but wow, look how high you went, so fun. So. Um, uh, I just totally love that it would be my sport. Um, a little background on me. I've been at Fandango for five and a half years. I'm senior manager of CRM strategy. And really my job is to think about how we're bringing Fandango's brand promise of ushering fans to the most, inter uh, the most moving entertainment experiences. How do we bring that to life through CRM? Great. How about you, Caroline? Hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, my summer Olympic event would be gymnastics. Um, I have always been a huge, huge fan, and I love that there are a variety of different ways to participate, whether or not you're a vaulter or you're mastering the floor or the bar, um, and then it all comes together in a whole team event at the end. Perfect. And can you give us a little background? Sure. Um, I have been at Chromadex now since uh, last June. So did make a switch during the pandemic. We, um, our flagship product is called True Niagen, which is an anti-aging supplement. Um, and I have been working in CRM, gosh, for almost a decade now, um, working at a variety of different D2C brands, including the Books Company and Janu and Isalon, um, and helping build kind of customized lifecycle journeys. Great. Chester, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> well, that's an easy one for, well, I mean, I got to call John out on this. If it was winter time, it would be skiing because I got to show him how it's done. But, but it's uh, not for, winter time. <laughs> but for summer, 
Um, it would definitely be volleyball. I've been playing volleyball for, well, since college. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm getting gray. So it's been a long time ago. Uh, but I'm with the Rent Path Group. I'm in charge of marketing technology here at Rent Path, um, predominantly managing our Salesforce Marketing Cloud instance and um, dabbling in other things within the organization and helping drive strategy where our email stuff is concerned. Prior to that, I mean, I've got a long and lengthy career. If anybody's interested, you can just find me on LinkedIn or, you know, if you have any questions afterward, my hashtag or my Twitter tag is on there, but you can also find me on LinkedIn too. Great. So now that we know what our sports are and what we're all, what our background is, let's dive into what your engagement focus is right now and potentially how it's changed, let's say over the past year or so. Chester? Sure, so at Ramp Path right now, um, we are really just focused on continuing to to get the most relevant content to our consumers. And we're doing that by expanding on how we interact with them. So traditionally, and basically for those of you who don't know what Rent Path, we're a lead generation service for properties that have properties to rent. So yes, and somebody's texting me in the middle of this, sorry, let me mute that. Um, but, so when you think about apartments or houses to rent, that sort of thing, that's what we do. So we own the apartment guide or we own apartmentguide.com and rent.com. Those are our primary domains. Some of you may have heard that we recently were purchased by Redfin. So now we're part of the Redfin network. Uh, but our, we're just trying to make sure that we can keep the consumers coming back. I think for a long time, there's been a focus in our organization about getting the consumer in, finding them a place to live or somewhere that they can submit a lead to and then shipping them off to go do that. Now we're moving forward and we're trying to create a, a longer journey or an engagement process with them where when they come back up, say a year from now and want to rent again, that we stay top of mind. We're trying to reduce our acquisition costs. Great. Caroline, how about you? Uh, so one of our main focuses is kind of redoing our customer lifecycle journey. So one of the biggest things that at True Niagen we have is education. So we are an anti-aging supplement, but I think educating our customers about what that does for you, what happens in your body as you're taking it, what happens um, month over month as you continue taking it. So we have a subscription, but we also have our new buyers and then along with our one-time buyers. So trying to find a way to customize the content in the right way for each point in your life cycle. So um, for our subscription customers, they might need to be able to get a different email than our one-time buyers, as well as our churn buyers, to be honest with you. And then we have our subset of group of people who are active buyers, but not necessarily subscription customers. So number one, do we upsell you on subscription or are we okay with you sitting here buying consistently, but just not jumping into that subscription realm? So um, we have a lot of education to do on our end too. So creating that journey for you when you first become a subscriber telling you, hey, this is what our product is all about. This is why you'd want to take it to nurturing you as you go along in your post-purchase after your first purchase. Hey, remember, take it daily. This is a supplement that you need time to go through. And then also, you know, we have a wealth of knowledge that we want to spread um, from our scientists. Uh, so we have a dedicated blog section of our website too. And that really helps connect with the consumer and allow them to understand the science and how it works in their body at a more human level. So providing them with that content to make sure that they understand what's happening and like the amazing thing that our super nutrient does. Awesome. And Sierra, I'm curious for you guys. I know we, we talked uh, yesterday about some stuff and having movie theaters be somewhat sh uh, shuttered for a while, slowly coming back in. How does that affect your uh, building of a fan journey type thing? Yeah, well, I think in terms of kind of our journey, we've always anchored around the movie life cycle, right? So when a first the first trailer drops, uh, you know, and it shows up on YouTube on our movie clips channel, uh, we also are sending out a push notification telling people to be the first to know when tickets go on sale, which is another moment to engage through email. Um, there are all these moments throughout that life cycle that we can engage with our customers. And the past year that, you know, things have been, uh, different. Uh, we've definitely had to pivot, but I will say in terms of our, our metrics and how we measure, uh, we've just had to, to switch it up a little bit. So we went from kind of 
looking at transactions and tickets and kind of understanding all these, uh, what our movie life cycle looks like to how can we work more cross-functionally uh, from a CRM perspective uh, and make sure that we're highlighting all the great work we're doing on social. How are we um, bringing people back into the fold when theaters are beginning to reopen? Um, and a lot of it, you know, we really went back to basics in terms of looking at uh, engagement, uh, like link reports. How is that translating to site traffic? Are we seeing spikes after we send an email? Are we seeing spikes after we send a push? Um, you know, it's been an interesting and, and fun uh, ride the past year. Great. Well, I appreciate all that input from all of you. I know kind of ties in a little to um, what Joe Tortell was saying about building a fan journey and reaching the fans or sorry, fan tour speak, building a customer journey and reaching out to those customers at the right time. Um, and Sierra, I know you had mentioned yesterday, like finding the moments to engage with that customer. And I, that really kind of stuck with me. That's really a, a great pearl of wisdom there. Along those lines, for people who may be kind of new to working out engagement and figuring out what a customer journey is and, and what metrics to look at, can y'all just give a quick down and dirty, like what's worked for you, what's not worth it? Um, I know we talked about it and so did Joe at Rite Aid as well, that you can't necessarily just look at opens and clicks. A lot of us are doing right. cross-channel type stuff. So you've got to kind of expand your view a little bit and see what's working and what's not. I yeah. think that's a, um, that's a challenging one, depending on your organization. When I was in the consulting world, it was really hard to find companies that really had a buttoned up, at least in the non-retail space, that really had a buttoned up kind of attribution model for whatever their true KPI is. When I came to RentPath, I was super lucky in that they're very metrics driven. And essentially we tie everything back to how many leads we're providing the company. And so for us within our org, within my team, we're, we're focused on leads per email sent or some derivation of that kind of metric. And that really helps us to know immediately is a test that we're working, making a difference or not. Do we need to do different things or not? It's much more meaningful to us than simple opens and clicks. Great. Yeah, I'll chime in. Just um, yeah. I think that in terms of, you know, we look at things like transactions and tickets, but I will say one of the way that we really think about things is really tailoring our objective and what that KPI is to what we're solving for. I mean, we always go back to well, what is it we're solving for? Because if it's a nurture series, the objective of a nurture series looks so much different than maybe your win back program or um, getting somebody to try an, a, a new product offering. So I think it kind of, it, it, it varies. And I feel like kind of regardless of the industry that you're in, just kind of asking yourself, well, well, what are we solving for? Uh, and what point in the, the customer life cycle and the customer journey mm -hmm. uh, are we at? I think kind of no matter where you are in your CRM journey, kind of what industry you're in, I feel like kind of tying your, uh, making sure that your campaign objective is really rooted in that. Uh, you're gonna find that it, your strategy uh, kind of writes itself almost, right? Yeah, right. and I can piggyback off that a little bit too. Yeah. Same way, I mean, while revenue is king, um, obviously in terms of what we're, whatever we're tracking, we always wanna be making money and having conversions. I think there's also the misnomer of also just sitting there saying like, okay, just because you open an email, open isn't necessarily top level engagement at this point anymore. You need to be clicking on an email. You need to be engaging on it. You need to be getting to a website and completing the purpose. So, you know, our post-purchase series is not going to be about revenue and conversion because you've just bought but it's about education and did we get you to the website and are you clicking through to the content that we're providing you? Whereas, you know, when you're in a welcome series and you first signed up to receive emails from someone, you can be having opens and clicks and click to open rates in there, but you also need to be looking at engagement. So, you know, we've run tests with just having a CTA and a hero image versus no CTA and the results vary what are like, you know, our prospects, for example, for someone who's never purchased, you'd think they'd need a CTA to click through actually their highest conversion comes from the non here, like the non CTA hero image. So, you know, you always have to kind of test and see what's working for your group because that changes over time too. And it's definitely changed in the pandemic. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna throw uh, one kind of last question up out there. I know we're running a little bit behind. Um, 
But uh, one thing that we've we touched on engagement, what are we doing? And Sierra, I'm going to start with you because I know you um, brought up a good point about how you're testing kind of stuff like this. But what do you do with those customers who are lapsed or inactive, you know, kind of stuck somewhere on their customer journey? Um, what do you guys, what kind of strategies and tactics are you using there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm in the camp that prevention is better than cure. Um, so what are those kind of signals and signs before a customer's too far gone that we can do to kind of get somebody back into the fold or re-engage with that consumer before it's too late? Now, um, you know, that doesn't always happen. And especially if we were to like pick up and start a new win back program tomorrow, there are customers that are already lapsed or that are already dormant. Uh, and so for those groups, one of the things that we've done that we've seen a lot of success with is really tapping into those segments judiciously. So maybe we just take a 5% sample or a 10% sample and run a test within that segment. And then can we pay those learnings forward uh, before we take it to scale, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really a way to kind of um, get a quick read. Are we heading in the right direction? Do we need to change strategy at all? Uh, and then that can actually become something more scalable in the future. Great. Chester, what about you? We, we're really, like I said before, we're, ju we're just focused on getting, retaining that relationship with the consumer. So we're looking ahead towards uh, what can we do after they've rented a place to continue to remind them, hey, we're a good resource for you. So we're moving forward with plans to develop a longer kind of a renter's life type of situation where you've got content that's relevant for where you're at in your journey as a renter. And by the way, reminding you that rent path is somewhere that you need to come back to. Great, thank you. Caroline? Um, I'd say one of the things that we've noticed, especially over the past six months or so is finding content that resonates with people on a human and everyday life level. So while we have a lot of science backing our product, for example, letting people understand that it helps with heart health, for example, and having that resonate. Oh, okay. That's something that reflects in my everyday life. Or, you know, saying that like, Hey, you know, it might help me as I'm working out and that recovery helps me figure out, you know, how to move forward. And that helps in my daily life. I think relating back to you as a person seems to be what's resonating with our customers a lot. And then letting them know that, Hey, you know, for example, you may be taking capsules, but we have stick packs as well. Have you tried that product yet? Letting them know that there's more than just one product and different ways that you can ingest the supplement as well. Great. Hey, I'm back. Hey, <laughs> Hi. Hi, Christy. How are you? Haven't seen Good. you in a bit. I know. Everyone else, Chester, Sierra, everyone. Um, well, I do have a question, of course. We want to make sure we hear yep. from our audience and um, we have from Rebecca, our main CTA is to get call or to, um, to get our agents because those, to get calls to our agents because those convert better than online lead form submissions. That makes our click rates very low though. Is that hurting our deliverability? Is it worth throwing in CTAs to click through to our website? Anyone wanna take that? I will. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, in my experience, I have not seen that necessarily harm deliverability. I think working with your email service provider, um, they should be able to provide some insights there just in terms of inbox placement and how that's doing. Um, if your main KPI and your primary driver, you know, is to get people to, to call and actually speak with someone, um, how can we kind of create that through line? Right. So how can you create that through line from, OK, well, um, did that consumer actually call? And then it, is there a way to kind of uh, tie that back to email and attribute it to make sure that we're delivering on those main KPIs? Because, you know, the objective isn't click through uh, and you said click through is low. So as long as we, we can check in with our email service provider and make sure that that's not harming deliverability in any way, uh, you just really want to make sure that you're actually delivering on that objective, which is um, you know, actually getting those consumers to call in. So we've done some things like that that are a bit, that are just beyond that click, you know, where we have to work with uh, our analytics team and work with other cross-functional teams to kind of help us create that through line. Jester, you've been shaking your head a lot. You have anything to add or? Yeah, I mean, 
for for me, it's kind of the same thing. We have two different ways that you can convert as a lead if you're a consumer with our tools. One of them is a phone number, and we have unique phone numbers for our email campaigns versus what we show on the web and elsewhere. It's where that's part of all that rich data set that we have access to. So we can tell pretty quickly from call volumes if a certain email is doing well or not. So um, as long as you've got that engagement, the, the deliverability side is a different animal. Like Sierra was saying, you should have access to some tools from your ESP, but you can also, um, there's other tools out there and other tool sets that you can subscribe to that will also help you understand what your inbox placement is and see where trouble exists. Yeah, I, I mean, I was gonna say, I would echo everything that was that was just mentioned. I'd say, you know, totally deliverability is, is a whole new level of something that you could dig into and you could spend hours talking about, but, um, yes. you know, definitely, you know, I think the time maybe. <laughs> yeah, definitely another time. But I think it's just also, yeah, monitoring everything because to Sierra's point, not everything is meant for a click through. Not everything has that same goal. So I think as long as you guys are tracking that as a company, um, you should be you should be good. And you can kind of tie that back. Same thing with us. Like we'll be able to tie back based on clicking through an email into a blog post, for example. Okay, and just another question. Um, are you exploring new and different ways of measuring engagement? You want to start? We'll start with you, put you on the hot spot. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I'd say one of the biggest things that I've been experimenting with, um, not necessarily new levels of engagement, but I'd say um, I have enjoyed testing just to see what customers are doing right now. I think there is a definitely different level of engagement as we've come into the pandemic of, you know, whether or not you can add a little bit fun into a subject line and test it versus a general one to add a little bit humor in the time that we're going through right now or testing different engagement points of tracking through on modules, for example, it's kind of a bit of a heat map in your email, um, which a lot of providers show, but you know, where are people clicking so that you can customize that content and customize that engagement in the right way for the right audience. How about yeah. Jester? Really just, I mean, um... Caroline hit it kind of right on the head. We're in a, a, it's everybody's first time being in a global pandemic. And so it's not necessarily new, um, new metrics or new engagement, but it's understanding how people are engaging now. Things are so different. So um, how has engagement changed relative to year on year? And then how has, uh, our, how has engagement changed by segment? You know, we know what we've seen historically, but this is everything right now is so new and different. Um, so it's really kind of just understanding uh, there's not like some new metric we've brought into the fold, but it just given that it's a, such a new time for, for kind of everyone, um, it's definitely provided a lot of uh, new insights. For us, it's not so much using a new metric or anything, but you know, given what Sierra has said about how consumer behaviors have basically implied how consumer behaviors have, have changed substantially in the last 12 months or so. Um, we haven't used send time optimization up until now. So we're getting ready to start doing some testing with send time optimization. And I'm kind of glad we waited until now to do it because now we have a year's worth of data about consumer behavior in this COVID world. Whereas beforehand, you know, I'm sure a lot of it showed, well, when they get to the office at 9 a.m., then they're checking their email and all that sort of stuff. We don't have that anymore. I don't know how many of you are checking your email at seven now because that's when your commute used to start, but that's certainly the case for me. So I know my behaviors have changed. So starting to use some of these other technologies like STO, I think are gonna be pretty significant for us. Great. Okay, well, you guys, that was great. It was really a lot of interesting information here that everyone's needing. So I appreciate you all being here and Christy, of course, for overseeing yeah. the group here. And no Sarah. problem. 